Hi, I'm Lee Aronson. Hi, and I'm Jason Kyle. Good. You, and we, you're and, and you're watching the. You're watching. Uh, you're watching the. You say. Go ahead. What is it called? Your, the TV Writer Podcast. You're watching the TV. The TV Writer, writer Potter. You say. The, I'm sorry. The, read, the TV. The reader. The TV, TV Writers Podcast. TV Writer Podcast. Go ahead. I'm writer sorry. or writers? There's two of us. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, episode 113 for October 20th, 2020. Well, today I have an interview with both Lee Aronson and Jason Kyle, uh, the founders of the Creators Writing Room. And it's a really exciting project that they have. You're going to love hearing about it. Uh, Lee has been writing for decades in, in the industry. He's done such uh, shows as The Love Boat, Who's the Boss, Creators in Charge, Murphy Brown. More recently, he was an executive, executive producer on Big Bang Theory, and he was also the co-creator of Two and a Half Men. Uh, Jason has a lot of experience in acting, writing, directing, and producing, and is currently at Sony Pictures TV. Um, it's a great interview, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, I did want to mention a housekeeping announcement, and that is that um, now that everybody's getting back to work, which is really great news, it also means that it's a lot harder for me to schedule interviews, and I'm also getting back to work myself. And so uh, I will not be able to maintain the weekly COVID um, interviews that I've been doing. It's it's an awesome, unique experience that I was able to release about 20-odd podcasts weekly during covid but now it's going to be much more like one or two episodes per month. I'll do my best. Hopefully I can maybe do them bi-weekly. But uh, just watch for my Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle, to find out when these episodes will be coming. And I would also appreciate for all of those of you who know people in the industry, uh, if you know anybody who would be available for an interview, shoot an email um, or send me a note on Twitter. Let me know. And if you can make that connection to help uh, more interviews happen on this podcast, it would be greatly appreciated. But now, on to my interview with Lee Aronson and Jason Kyle. Enjoy. Well, this is Gray, and I'm here with Lee Aronson and Jason Kyle, founders of the Creators Writing Room. How are you guys doing? Just swell. <laughs> you look, if, I, if, I, if I'm being honest, I mean, look, I could talk for an hour about how poorly I'm doing, given all the, the state of the world, but let's just say I'm doing great. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Well, I, I, I've got an apartment. I've got an Xbox. I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got some food in the fridge. We're doing okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I I just heard somebody say today that this was the thirty third week of of quarantine, and it's crazy. That's like more than I've half been of on a year. sitcoms that didn't last this long. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, this is this is Lee's I think thirty third year of quarantine. Would you say, Lee? <laughs> uh, I, I I'm a homebody. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, well we have a lot. Lee was, was show running shows. He was, he was in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, yeah, that, that's kind of more of a hostage situation than quarantine. Yeah. Well, um, for, we're going to structure it this way. I really want to hear about the creators writing room, but we'll do that sort of the back half of the interview. First, I want to get to know who you guys are and then how you got together. Um, why don't we start with, with Lee? Tell me about your background in TV and sort of key signposts along your, your TV writing career. Key signposts. Wow. Uh, moved to L.A. in 1977. I wanted to be a stand-up comic, uh, hung out at the comedy store in the improv, did open mics, got virtually nowhere, hung out with, uh, you know, people like Letterman and Leno and wow. Andy Kaufman and Robin Williams and uh, basically starved to death. And I got an opportunity to... Um, submit ideas to a show called The Love Boat, mm. and they bought one of them. And before I knew it, I was a staff writer on Rub Boat, Love Boat, and uh, then I became a drug addict and uh, took a few years off. And then I got sober and came back and uh, worked in sitcoms for a long time because it turned out there was nothing else I could do in this town that people would pay me to do that did not involve anal sex. So, <laughs> Wow. And you, and Wait, you... Let's go back to those two years you took off as a drug addict. I want to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't remember a lot about it, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I love I love there was a bit of trivia I just have to mention you named the Vicky character of Love Boat after your dog yeah um, it, it just happened to turn it we you know we're just coming out with names for the girl and I pitched Vicky because uh, had a dog named Vicky and uh, it stuck Wow very cool and you worked on some some pretty big comedies over the years who's the boss Charles in charge Murphy Brown Sybils I mean and uh, also, Big Bang Theory, more recently, you were an EP on that. Um, what, t talk about that time, sort of how you've seen the industry change and, and what your experience has been through it. Well, when I started, um, there were bases, there were three networks, and um, most of the writing was done freelance. I mean, I was hired as a, a staff writer on Love Boat, and the staff was like three people, you know, one team and me. Uh, you know, now most shows, by the time I ended on Two and a Half Men and Big Bang Theory, we were doing everything gang written. And, um, uh, you know, the rooms, the staff was eight, nine, ten people hmm. in it. That, that's a big change. Uh, there's so many more outlets today. It's, it's, you know, it's both easier and tougher to break in. It's easier because there's more buyers and it's tougher because there's a lot more competition. Hmm. Well, talk about um, your experience. You created Two and a Half Men. Um, I co-created. Co-created. I the pilot, Chuck Lorre. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, tell me about that experience. Well, at the time, um, this was 2003. I had been working for about. 20 years pretty steadily you know i worked on a few shows with chuck i worked my way up through you know story editor co-producer producer supervising producer co-executive producer uh i created a show that lasted four episodes on cbs uh -huh. and i was hitting a i was approaching 50 years old and things slowed down i uh reached the point where um uh, I was in danger of losing my Writers Guild health insurance. Oh, wow. And Chuck had a deal at Warner Brothers where he had not gotten anything on the air for a few years. He'd, he'd done a few pilots, and I'd helped out with them, but that wasn't enough to keep my insurance going. And so um, uh, somebody came to Chuck, Eric Tannenbaum, who had I'd worked with at Columbia on an overall uh, he'd run Columbia TV. He was now a pod producer. And he came to Chuck with with a concept. And Chuck had no reason to want to get in business with anybody outside himself. But I said, look, you know, uh, you know, I can write this. You supervise. Uh, I'll, it'll be a pilot. I'll get my, you know, insurance current. And that's it. And then, you know, I'll help you on whatever your next show is. Uh -huh. um, which at the time was going to be a Tyler Perry sitcom, which had a 13 on the air commitment. And wow. so, uh, you know, Chuck not only supervised, he ended up writing it with me. And, um, and we got Charlie Sheen attached. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it became a go pilot. And Tyler Perry, the Tyler Perry project evaporated. Tyler, Either Tyler decided he didn't want to be on CBS, or CBS decided they didn't, they weren't ready to go into black sitcoms yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, Two and a Half Men became a thing. And uh, we did the pilot. The pilot turned out great, got on the air. We were the right year, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Everybody Loves Raymond was in its last year. So we got the post Raymond time slot, groomed to take over <laughs> nine o'clock on Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, and did very well and better than anybody could have possibly anticipated. And so um, I want to call out some silver lining, Lee. I think the silver lining there is if this country's health care system was not completely fucked, Lee would never have had <laughs> this is that This show. is absolutely he true. For the health care. Yeah. Well, I'd had hell if I if I didn't have to worry about my health insurance, uh, there'd be no two and a half men. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's the trade off. <laughs> and if Chuck weren't such a mensch. <laughs> <laughs> Is isn't that the way though? I mean, so so many of the stories in Hollywood are about stuff like that. Like um Lost um came out of Survivor and if it hadn't been for Survivor and sort of things like that, then Lost would never have been. And and there's so many things like that that it, it's uh 
and you'll do a, a great pilot that doesn't fly. You'll do one that you're you're not even sure is gonna see the light of day, and it becomes this hit series. Right. I, I was. I actually didn't think Big Bang Theory was gonna fly. Hmm. Shows you how much I know. <laughs> Cool. Well, there's an interesting story behind that, right? Like we we broke down um, the differences between the two pilot episodes, right? And you guys got like a second chance at that. Talk, talk to that a little bit. That's a, mm-hmm. Well, the, I like that. Story. You know, Chuck and Bill Prady created Big Bang Theory, and um, you know, I helped out on the first pilot, which was uh, considerably different than what aired it had uh sheldon and leonard were the same but uh, all the other characters were different it was a harder edged uh female in the show Mm -hmm. and it didn't get picked up but uh kind of unprecedentedly cbs allowed uh chuck and bill to retool the pilot and Mm -hmm. i mean it happens sometimes but very rarely and even more rarely does it actually work Hmm. And so uh, the Penny character was uh, created, and the uh, the Kutherpali and Wallowitz characters were added, and you know we reshot it. And I still I thought it was really funny, but I thought it was too niche. Hmm. You know, I, I didn't think it was going to last for more than a season or two. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out, we were able. You know, I ended up executive producing the show along with Bill and Chuck. And uh, we were able to expand the the show beyond the just Penny wants uh, Shel- uh, Leonard wants to sleep with Penny. Will they or won't they? Uh, to encompass relationships among all of them, we brought in some more female characters. You know, we enlarged the family, we enlarged the scope of the show, and it, mm. it ran for twelve years. Wow! Wow! That's another um, one to your point, Graham, right? We almost yeah. didn't have a Big Bang Theory. I mean, you know, these things are so close to happen. It's like the will they or won't they, just like we see in the uh, in the sitcoms. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I, I'm always so encouraged when I hear about the the, the revived projects or, or projects that, it, like, uh, it's a movie, but The Sixth Sense, it was the 10th draft that he came up with a twist. And if it hadn't been for that twist, it would not have been the same movie. Really? What, what what was it before that he, well, ba- he basically he doesn't see dead people? Or the, the, the the twist Bruce about Bruce Willis is not dead. And, and sorry, this is, this is a spoiler, but um, Bruce Willis was alive um, uh-huh. up up and to the, the ninth uh, up to the ninth <laughs> draft, and it was a tenth draft that he said, "Wait a second, what if?" And and that became the the massive twist that uh, that made it a hit movie. I, I appreciate Graham's etiquette on, on the this is a spoiler, right? Like, even though the movie came out. Like, the movie's like maybe 20 years old, right? Like, yeah. if you haven't seen The Sixth Sense by now, then we, should, we probably spoiler should. Spoiler alert, Rosebud was a sled. <laughs> well, I, 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 have I, to, I have to be mindful. The, the people that, uh, a lot of the people who are checking out this podcast are sort of new film students. And mm-hmm. they, I, anything that isn't widescreen is history. Um <laughs> So, yeah, I was talking about Citizen Kane the other day with someone. They were like, well, hey, don't spoil it. I haven't seen it. I'm yeah. like, well, if you haven't seen Citizen Kane yet, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's a, there has to be a statute of limitations on this spoiling. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, let's, let's move on and, uh, and talk about Jason. Jason, your background is, is pretty varied acting, writing, directing, producing. Tell me about all that. Wow. Well, before all of that, um, I took the very traditional entertainment industry route of serving in the Peace Corps in Albania and working for a big management consulting company. Like, I feel like everybody who's in entertainment, I think Lee might be the exception to the rule. Everybody else <laughs> probably <laughs> takes that path. Um, uh-huh. But, I, yeah, so I that was I just want to interject when you say I served <laughs> in the Peace Corps in Albania. You know, that sounds yeah. like a joke. It sounds like, a, you know, somebody just yeah, said, what, yeah, this is... Who actually did serve in the Peace Corps in Albania? Yes. You know, I think back, you know, if I were, I actually found my partner who I've been with now for over 10 years, close to 10 years. We met back in 2011. Her and I always joke that if I were to pick up women at a bar with this story, like that, that story's too good. Mm. Like people were like, yeah, I don't believe, you were in the Peace Corps in Albania, like I don't buy that. Um, (laughs) So another joke is that, um, a lot of Americans, when I got back home, did not know where Albania was on the map. So my joke 
because I started doing stand up back in 2013 was when I tell people I was in the Peace Corps in Albania, they always say, well, I didn't know they needed that much help in upstate New York because we were <laughs> in Albania, where, like, where is this place? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so, so shortly after college, I served in the Peace Corps. Um, I wound up staying after my service for about another year, year and a half. So I, I lived in Albania for close to four years. Wow. Uh, doing some business development, freelance consulting work. I came back to the U.S. and I took a job with a big management consulting company, and that relocated me out to San Francisco. And it was two days into that job when I Googled how to be a stand-up comedian. You Googled it. The results were, yeah, the results were pretty much, we'll just start doing it. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, I literally Googled that because I was sitting at my desk. I was so miserable. I had such severe reverse culture shock hmm. from living in a country for close to four years where there were no creative opportunities hmm. for young people. Like, you couldn't just go and be a stand-up comic in Albania. You couldn't just, like, get a camera and start making it. Like, you could, but they were the arts had just been completely wiped out for generations from that country that it, it just wasn't, wasn't an opportunity that existed there. And for me, I was, I know every episode of Seinfeld by heart. Mm. I grew up watching it and seeing Jerry do the stand up, and then just see him be sort of an everyday eh, self-absorbed narcissist. It kind of normalized this idea of like, Oh yeah, Jerry, like he, you know, stand-up comedy. I guess anybody could just like do stand-up comedy and that's going to show. Mm. So it was always in the back of my mind. I just never pursued it out of fear because I thought this is safer. If I just take this job, it's safer. I, I do the nine to five and get healthcare, right? Lee, it's safer. Um, and it wasn't until I started working that job after I came home from Albania and I thought, you know what? These opportunities did not exist in Albania. Here we are in America where every opportunity is at our fingertips. doesn't mean it's easy by mm. any means, but we have the opportunity to pursue these things. And that just didn't sit right with me. So mm. um, I, wound up, I wound up leaving that job uh, because, because they asked me to. Um, they realized, well, this guy, this guy should not be here. We, we fucked up on hiring this guy. So uh, I wound up getting fired. It was a blessing in disguise doing stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy led me to improv. And I remember watching an episode of Inside the Actor's Studio with Dave Chappelle. And Dave Chappelle said, if you want to be good at comedy, you have to take acting classes. I said, okay, this guy's good at comedy. I should follow what he says. I took my first acting class at ACT in San Francisco, and my teacher cast me in a dramatic play from that class. So like wow. it all just kind of took off from there. And like I never looked back into like the corporate have a resume, apply for jobs type of thing. Hmm. And so you, you have quite a few acting credits, um, also writing, directing, producing. Tell me about sort of the next few years. Yeah, so I, 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 we can sum it up by saying all failures, right? Here, here's what I want to say about the failures is that it's not about the failure. It's what we can, we can learn and, and how we grow from these failures. So mm-hmm. I and directed and acted and produced in my own TV pilot. It's, it was called the Bay area show. Mm-hmm. And it was a hybrid of like Conan O'Brien meets uh, Portlandia. And Graham, you joked a little bit about, about making sure we rem- remember to, to hit record or don't mess up the recording. Uh-huh. Halfway through the first day I had rented out this studio and we had a three camera setup. And I checked in with the guy who was working the camera and I said, you know, so how's everything looking? He's like, I forgot <laughs> to hit record <laughs> on one of the cameras. And I said, you're kidding me. Oh and my. up until that point, I, I, I was killing myself trying to put all of this together. Mm. And, you know, that pilot wound up going nowhere. I remember mm. shooting a film that was based on this podcast that I heard and it was specifically for the creator of that podcast. And I yeah. wound up spending hours out of my own pocket, got the crew together. It was a beautiful film. Uh, I acted in it. I directed it. I produced it and wrote it. And I got an email back from that person just saying, Hey, nice work. And that wound up not going anywhere. So again, I took that as, as like in the moment it was a failure, 
but I was able to learn from all of these things and apply them to what I would do going forward instead of just saying, I can't make it and I give up. Um, so a lot of failures along the way. And, and I was very close and Lee knows this story. He was with me on the night that it happened. I was so close to like throwing in the towel and wondering just like, like this is uh, now I'm fast forwarding now to a couple of years in LA mm. and I had no job. I had no money. I was flat broke. I was a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Um, I was sitting in Lee's car. Like I started to cry and I remember him telling me like, you know, you, you, you're smart, you're talented, just stick with it. Trust me. Like something is going to click. And I went home and I sat on my floor in the dark and I cried and I cried and my cat came over to me and crawled on my lap and she looked at me and she kind of like the same with those eyes. And I could hear Lee's voice, like just stick with it. Everything's going to be okay. And I wound up stumbling into this assistant gig and that kind of changed my life and, and really got me, got my foot real. I had been chipping away at it for so many years, but really got my foot in the door. Mm. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. The, there's this idea that things just happen in such a linear way when you, no. uh, when you break into this industry and I, I can think, I mean, I, this is episode 113 or something. And I think there's I want to say maybe two out of those that were linear. Mm -hmm. I, what you, the stuff that you're sharing is is much more typical of of when somebody breaks mm -hmm. into the industry. It's it's going around and around and around in different plays and off often going way back, getting demoted pretty far. Um, I mean, how many how many people were lawyers before they broke in and have to go right back to being an assistant? It's so true. It's so true. I mean, I, I was, you know, making six figures at this consulting job, but I was absolutely miserable. I hated it. I wasn't good at it. It wasn't until I started to follow my heart and my passion of, of telling stories. And I thought, okay, if this is what I ultimately want to do, like I need to start from the ground up and act as if I am a college intern. Right. Mm. But the good thing about that is I had all of this life experience. I had already traveled to a bunch of different places and, and worked professionally. So I came just with a different level sort of, a, of experience and a different mindset that just helped me absorb information a lot more quickly. And I met a great mentor in Lee. I mean, Lee's been in the business for so long and, you know, just his friendship has helped me so much. Uh, uh, he's going to think I'm, I'm joking and making this up because I don't tell him often enough, but it's true. But having Lee is sort of a, a, a mentor and somebody who has been through ups and downs in this business and kind of just helping me maneuver a little bit, I had made a world of a difference. Hmm. Well, talk about the meet cute. I mean, you, you guys seem like a bit of an unlikely couple. Tell me about how, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're made for each other. Uh, yeah. yeah what, tell what me about that. What is that about this? <laughs> No, uh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, so real quick, Lee, Lee um, so I went to a, a play here in Los Angeles, and I met this, this gentleman during intermission, and we chatted, and he was very charming and very funny. I met him again once the play was over. Again, very charming, very funny. This was the, the director of that play. Uh, and then I wound up putting up a play at that same theater. That same director came to see my play, and we chatted again. Again, very funny, very charming. I could just tell he's... He was uh, just very easygoing and down to earth, and we just kind of hit it off. And then uh, Jason and, and I met man, in a bar, totally unrelated. And then, <laughs> and then that man introduced me to Lee. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, it's so fun. Yeah, Lee and I, I met Lee at a play that he was directing, and I wound up putting a play that, that I wrote and directed at that same theater, and, and we just kind of stayed in touch. And, and I had no idea at the time who Lee was or what any of his credits were. Like, we just kind of had, like, a good rapport. Mm. Um, and we wanted just hanging out. That's just because he didn't read the resume I gave him. It was... <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was in the, yeah, what was it? The, it was in the playbill, and I'm like, I'm yeah. not reading it. I mean, come on, it's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, and, yeah, uh, so it was just kind of like one of those, like, it's a small world, small industry type of thing. And Yeah, I mean, once, I, really once, I, once I walked away or stepped back from my professional career, which was 
date from basically the last episode of Two and a Half Men. Um, I really decided I'd done enough sitcoms. Uh, I decided to do other things to keep my creative juices flowing. So started giving classes, uh, you know, doing uh, doing panels and uh, shooting short films. And uh, one of the things was I directed this play for somebody who was in one of my classes. And it was in a you know little North Hollywood uh, theater, and so you meet a lot of people, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot different people than the people that I I already knew, and I found them a lot more interesting and a lot more fun to be around. Yeah, <laughs> Jason was uh, tops among them. Yeah, uh, I was. I think at that time or shortly after, I was teaching improv at the SAG Astra Conservatory here in LA. Mm. And Lee briefly mentioned it, but Lee was teaching a great class on on gang writing, which they then turned into like shooting short films. And then Lee and I teamed up on on teaching a class. Lee was leading an on camera comedy class. And then that morphed into us creating an in person gang writing class. Mm-hmm. that we were going to shoot some shorts afterwards. But COVID hit right at the time we were about to start that class. Mm-hmm. And so that, I imagine, was the genus for Creators Writing Room. Uh, we're going to talk about, at, talk about that after a quick sponsor break. DrivingFootage.com provides 4K nine-angle driving plates for film and television. Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with more areas coming soon. A fully equipped camera car with height-adjustable rig is available for custom shoots and second-unit photography. Visit drivingfootage.com for details. avgearguide.com provides computer and gear rentals serving the LA area, including laptops with final draft, as low as $9 a day with long booking rates available. They also scan photos, documents, video and audio tapes, and film reels to digital, so you can easily share with your friends and family. Not only can you scan prints as low as 25 cents, slides and negatives as low as 33 cents, and import videotapes as low as $7.99, mention the name of the TV Writer Podcast and you will get 10% off your order. Visit avgearguide.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person video interviews to you. And we're back. And so uh, I want to hear all about the creator's writing room and sort of how it went from the the class that you were going to teach together and morphed into this much bigger thing. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead, Lee. (laughs) Well, as as Jason was saying, you know, before COVID hit, uh, you know, we were doing uh, some classes. I was doing an... uh, an in-person gang writing on camera comedy kind of thing, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then COVID hit, had to stop doing that. And Jason came up with the idea of doing a, a, a zoom show where we would talk about, uh, well, the first one we did was just, uh, basically an ask me anything. Yeah. A little, a Q and A. Yeah. Q and A. And uh, then he came up with the idea of uh, screening sitcom pilots and, you know, uh, deconstructing them, analyzing them as, mm-hmm. as we watched. And that became a Zoom show called Co-Pilots, which, uh, I don't know, we've done about half a dozen so far. Mm-hmm. And we do them on a regular basis. And those are a lot of fun. Uh, we take questions and comments from people viewing in. And Jason has started uh giving classes on Zoom on pitching and thinking like a studio exec. And uh, so we decided to basically create an infrastructure so that when COVID ends, we can continue to offer free content uh, and also um, have an infrastructure so that when we can do in-person classes again, you know, we've got an existing base of people who know who we are mm. and know what we do. And that's uh, Creators Writing Room. We've got a Twitter account, uh, which posts uh, outside articles of uh, 
uh, interest to creators. And by creators, we're not just talking about writers. You know, mm-hmm. everybody mm-hmm. creates. Actors are creators. Producers mm-hmm. are creators. Directors are creators. Writers are creators. And um, so the things that we are concentrating on are, are is information and skills that are valuable to everybody. You know, it doesn't hurt to know the principles of comedy writing if you want to act in comedy, for instance. It doesn't mm. hurt to know the principles of comedy, you know, four camera sitcom performance if you want to be a writer of those mm. things. Uh, mm. It's very uh, cross disciplinary. Yeah, Lee, Lee Scott. I'm sorry, go ahead, Graham. I was just going to say, what, what would you say? What need is it filling? Like, who, who's your target audience for this? Yeah. When Lee and, I, when, when Lee and me, he always corrects me, because Lee and me sounds weird. Lee and I just sounds a little bit more musical. I think Sorkin would appreciate Well, in that it. case. Albeit, when <laughs> albeit I, it's not grammatically correct. No, Lee, when Lee and I did something is grammatically okay. correct. The way you do it is you just... You you take out the Lee and and see if it fa- sounds right. When I yeah, did something, I, I'm aware, I went to grade school. No, I'm aware. Okay. I'm aware. But I, 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 I but I do appreciate the clarification around how to speak my native tongue. <laughs> well, you know, just because it's your native tongue doesn't mean that you're proficient at it. This is true. This is I mean, I'm Judaism not is my, my native religion. Tongue. I know I could not give the Kaddish in Hebrew. Sorry. True. This is true. I am not proficient in my native tongue or my non-native tongue. I'm not proficient in any of it. Uh, Graham, so it started with, yeah, you know, when COVID hit and this whole like the Zoom. The question is, be, who was our target audience, Jason? He wasn't, I'm getting he wasn't asking there. for the story I'm, of your life here. <laughs> our target audience is whoever's interested in uh, getting information that isn't readily, you know, available. There's lots of acting classes hmm. and there's lots of writing classes, but there's not a There's none that I know uh, that teach gang writing. There's none that I know that uh, teach performance for writers or writing for performers um, and actually doing hands-on stuff. You know, we, we write together. We rehearse together, we stage it, uh, and in some cases we shoot it. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, it it's, it's the sort of thing that I wish existed when I was starting out. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I appreciate I, that. I, it, it, on, uh, when I was looking on your website, you mentioned the knowledge gap. Um, and, right. and I think it, there's, there's such a wealth of content freely available on the Internet now that we can get the illusion that that covers everything. And yet mm-hmm. there's big yeah, here, gaps. Yeah, here, here's, here's what I'll just say uh, about the Internet. It is less about information now and more about confirmation for what people want to believe or what they mm. believe. So, so with that, yes, while there is a wealth of, of knowledge and information available, it's, it's hard to really dive into the type of information you need to succeed in this business. Mm. So uh, where I'm at now, I started out as an assistant at CBS Studios. Uh, with uh, Glenn Geller, who, who's the former president of CBS, and him and I moved over to Sony, where we work with the creators of Homeland. Uh, so now I'm in the development coordinator role, also a little bit more of creative executive, also assistant, like we wear many hats because it's a very small company. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I've gotten to learn over these past couple of years at CBS and at Sony is the pitch process and the knowledge gap of what that pitch process actually is for your TV series versus what we as up and coming creators outside of the industry know of that process, which is Mm. very little. And, and what I try to emphasize all the time to newer writers and creators is that we are always pitching. Mm. We're always pitching ourselves as writers and creators. We're always pitching our TV series. We're always pitching it in short form or long form. And the succinctness and the efficiency and the brevity is what gets lost, whether you're a newer writer or even a well-seasoned, experienced writer. Hmm. So I thought, okay, well, why don't we have something that teaches what would make a strong pitch? How do we go about doing that before they even get the opportunity? Like, it's not let's wait until we get the opportunity to pitch our TV show. Let's learn how to pitch a TV show. So when that opportunity comes, we're ready to go. 
Mm. You know, and there, there's no one size fits all. Too every pitch situation is different. Uh, when I started pitching, nobody nobody told me anything. I, it was just here you are. You're going into a room, pitch it, and you know, through trial and error. Uh, you learn some things over the years, but the big myth in this business is that there's this this level of people that are all brilliant and know what they're doing, and and that, that there are rules to deal. There aren't, you know. Most people, most of the business is just running on people trying to keep their jobs, and uh, you know, people that are in a position to say no are a lot more numerous than people who are in a position to say yes. And you need to understand the dynamics that are at work here and not expect that everything is going to you know, be logical or make a lot of sense or even be fair because none of that is true. And if I'd had some insight into that when I started, I could have saved myself a lot of stress and a lot of wasted pitches. Mm. Yeah, Lee and I, Lee, we talk about the, the, the mission really with the creator's writing room is to demystify the business mm. because I felt the exact same way well, when I was on the outside looking in and still in many ways I, I still am. Uh, you know, we, we put these things and certain people up on pedestals and we want to normalize that. And, and we, and I both enjoy inspiring people and normalizing that for up and coming creators. It's, this is absolutely attainable. Like Lee's done it for many, many years. I am currently in the industry hearing pitches all the time. Like we can absolutely do it. And, and we don't really have superpowers. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and tell me about how the, the zoom format, um, helps this. I, I know we never expected this to happen. Most of us had no idea what zoom was before we, before COVID hit. My, my daughter actually took part of a course, recently with Pilar Alessandra, and um, she wrote a TV pilot in two weeks. She's 17 years old. (laughs) Yeah, two weeks. Um, There's something about these Zoom classes, being able to connect one-on-one with with the instructor versus something just, you know, watching a YouTube video. For the actual motivation and accountability, I think it's it's actually, um, I don't know, I don't know, even, even, in some ways, more than than a, a class, I think you can you can sit in the back of a class and not necessarily um, have the same level of involvement as as if as compared to when you're in that Zoom um, box as yes. as big as everybody else. You're absolutely right, and and we do it's all theory into practice. It's not you know me or Lee sitting there and just like talking at people. First thing is we keep class sizes very small. I mean, think like one class could have anywhere from six to eight, another one maybe anywhere from eight to 10. That's where we Mm -hmm. cap it because we want to make sure everybody has a chance to contribute and to do work and be heard and ask questions. Like there's no value from the creator side of having a Zoom with 100 people just show up to an hour long webinar where where one of us are talking at them and they pay a ridiculous amount of money. Like, Again, our, our job is to demystify this business and to really have a hands-on approach to helping up and coming creators. Mm. Yeah, but all, also, let's uh, two things. One is we do do uh, things like co-pilots where we have over a hundred people. Oh yeah, yeah, watching yeah. And, and and that's hopefully free. gaining something from it. We don't charge for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second of all, the biggest selling point to this whole thing is you don't have to wear pants, and I, I think people just. Have, have underestimated the value of being able to conduct business <laughs> no without pants. wearing pants. And we've discovered <laughs> yeah. that during COVID. That's been the big gift. You mm-hmm. don't have to get up. You don't have to get dressed. You don't have to get in your car. You don't have to deal with traffic. Um, and it's a much more it's much more conducive, I think, to the interchange of uh, creativity and information when you're relaxed like that. Mm. And pass. Roll, you, you roll over, you turn on your laptop, and then it's usually me saying, you're muted, you're muted, you're muted 20 times, and then they unmute, and we do clap. Mm-hmm. And, and I imagine something like the um, gang writing, uh, when you have six, eight people, every person has a chance to speak. 
Yeah, that's well, part of the art of gang writing, you know, is knowing when to speak and when not to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we haven't done an online gang writing class yet. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I uh, you really kind of have Please? to be Go ahead. I, in the I, same I, I'm room. open to it. Huh? I'm open to it, but I'm open to it. But that's up to Lee. Yeah, uh, it, it, we we tried some online stuff um, during the uh, uh, during the Charlie Sheen debacle. We had to work uh, we had to work from home a little bit. Uh, it it it's tougher. It's tougher because you, need, you really need to be able to see faces. Uh, you need to you need to have more than one person talking at the same time. Um, it's I, I don't know. I I'm, I give it a shot, but uh, it's not anything I'm anxious to do particularly. <laughs> well, well, tell me about the different classes and tracks that you do have right now. Yeah, so we 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 like to keep things really simple. You know, our our level one is called Think Like a Studio Exec, and in that class, we do it, it's more about the business side of how our business functions it's about the current landscape of tv i talk to a lot you know i do a lot of just like free one-on-one consultations with writers and they'll talk about it, it, i mean i see cheers and seinfeld all the time on tv and syndication and like you know i, I just know writers are making a lot of money from that hmm. yes these are shows from the 80s and 90s the landscape of television, like Lee said, when he was, at, you know, there were three channels, like the landscape has completely evolved mm-hmm. and how things make money is drastically different right now than it was, it, I will say, even two years ago, let yeah. alone during the Seinfeld and Cheers Day. So we really highlight those things. We talk about how to leverage intellectual property. We talk about how to leverage putting together a package of auspices for your project. So it's, it's, and we cover pitching, right? So it's all of these things that we would do at the studio level and get studio level notes the same way any established writer, creator, showrunner is, is developing or pitching their own show. So really giving some insight into the business side and how we can use that to leverage our own creative ideas. I feel like there's a big, we talked about knowledge gap before, there's a big knowledge gap in terms of how the business functions, how the business makes money, Hmm. Even something as simple as a difference between a network and a studio. Yeah. Like CBS has a network and a studio. What's the difference? Like we really break those things down. And the other one we do is, is a level two, which is create a winning pitch for your TV series. Hmm. And we cover written pitches, visual pitches, and verbal pitches. The three aspects that you need to be proficient in if you're going to eventually want to pitch your show. Um, so again, we keep class sizes really small so we can make sure we can work intimately with people on their pitches and understand the importance of, of all these aspects. I think the best way to find out, you know, uh, what we offer is to go to our website, uh, mm-hmm. the CWroom.com, uh, and follow us on Twitter at the CW Room. Um, what else do we want them to do on Twitter, Lee? What do we, oh, you could follow me. I'm at Benny Ace. Um, <laughs> Graham, I'm convinced Lee only does this. If you me insist so upon following me, I, I won't block you. That's that's <laughs> fine. You do that. Yeah. And and you did mention that those uh, co-pilots. Now, are they about? Can you go back and listen to previous co-pilots, or do you have to watch them live? Excellent question, Lee. Well, you do have to watch them live um, unless you uh, become a, uh, a member. I don't know what we're calling it yet, uh, but there will be, <laughs> there will be a member's uh, tier, which will have a nominal uh, cost established to it, uh, where we will have all the episodes available for uh, perusal, as it were. But... Uh, you know, most of what we offer, I'm not doing this for the money. Um, mm. Jason can speak for himself there, but um, oh, it's all about money for me. I, I just, I, I particularly just, you know, <laughs> don't want it to cost a lot of money. Uh, mm. But uh, so I'm, I'm fine with, you know, offering a lot of free content, which I think we do. By the way, I'm, I'm kidding about we, we make zero money. Yes, we charge for our classes. We don't make any money. I mean, when it comes down to like. 
paying certain the people that are helping us out when it comes down to the editing and hosting the website. Graham, you know this. Expenses oh, yeah. add up, my friend. Yeah. Uh, so, and yeah, to Lee's point, yeah, we really do try to keep prices low. Like I do one-on-one consultation with writers. Uh, again, we do our best to just like not take too many people on because at the end of the day, it's just Lee and and me. That's it. There's no other, like we don't have a full staff of people giving notes on people's scripts and running co-pilots. Um, but yeah, and we try to offer as much free content as possible. Co pilot and, and we have no sponsors. Hmm. And we have no sponsors. No Grand commercials. commercials. We welcome sponsors. If, uh, if you know them, willing to, to, to sponsor, uh, an odd couple style type of zoom show, uh, and we have another free show called uh, The Pitch, which is a Q&A. It's an interactive Q&A hmm. with writers, showrunners, and producers, where the first half, I'll ask them a bunch of questions about their career. And then the second half, we bring our community members up and, and we put them on screen and they get to ask their questions directly to our guest. So um, those, are the, those are the two things that, because, yeah, people ask us all the time, right, Lee, about, Oh, I missed it. Can I watch this episode? Or I'm calling in from Australia and I, the time doesn't work for me. When can I watch it? So we're going to be rolling that out pretty soon. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we'll uh, be wrapping up soon. Any Anything else that you'd like to say about Creators Writing Room? Anything uh, else you want to pitch here? TheCWRoom.com. I mean, that that's all you really need to know. All the info is there. Um, <laughs> Costs you nothing. <laughs> and uh, at Benny Ace on Twitter. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can subscribe on our website, and you will get email to all of these free things that we do. We will literally send you the Zoom link, hmm. but not a lot of emails. It's not one of those things where you sign up and then every day, you know, no. twice a day, you're getting crap yeah. in your email. No, we do, we just we just email you when there's something specific. Uh, that you you would want to know about. Cool, very cool. And I and you I should what? mention this is um this is being released Tuesday, October twentieth. And I did notice on your website that you have a, a couple of classes that start this weekend. Um, and so to the viewers, I would mention uh, check out their website right away, just in case one of these classes that's starting is something that might be of interest to you. I second the motion. <laughs> Yeah, we, I, think, I think we have one seat left in our creator winning pitch and our studio exec class. This is the last one we're doing for 2020. Uh, we'll have a couple of other pitch classes coming up in December. But, yeah, I mean, you know, when you keep class sizes small and prices fairly affordable, I guess they – and offer valuable services, I guess that's a good combination for seats filling up pretty quickly. I, I, hmm. Very cool. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up here, but definitely the CWroom.com. Everybody, make sure to go there, um, follow uh, uh, both Lee and Jason on Twitter, and make sure that you sign up for that email list so that you can hear about the free content and also valuable paid content that they have to offer. Um, guys, I'm so grateful for you taking this time. Uh, you've been very generous with your time, and uh, best of luck to you with the Creators Writing Room and all your... Um, future projects, especially Jason, with all the stuff you're pitching. Thanks for having us. It's it's been a pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us. Oh, and by the way, Graham, big mm-hmm. fan of your podcast, right? Oh, here. thanks. <laughs> Very cool. So, yeah, oh, thanks, and actually, if you know for... any writers um, that would be uh, good to interview and would be open to it, please send them my way. We'll do. Yeah, we do. We do the same thing with that show where we were talking about the pitch, and and mm-hmm. yeah, I, I know. A, a few people that we've talked to that I think would be great guests for you. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Well, thanks, guys. Take care. All right, man. Uh, you too. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. And that was my interview with Lee Aronson and Jason Kyle. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do go to the CWroom.com and find out all about the creator's writing room. Make sure to subscribe on all of the places you can find this podcast. Podbeam, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, the TVWriterPodcast.com site, or also at ScriptMag.com, and now also on Pandora. And if you're on Instagram, please follow at TVWriterPodcast. Please do follow me on Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle.
If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do it for as little as 25 cents per episode. You can find out how you can become a patron of the podcast or a sponsor of the podcast at tvwriterpodcast.com slash support. That's all we have for this week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.